We've come now to the seventh chapter, and this seventh chapter brings us to what I have given as the theme in my book on Revelation. God seals a remnant of Israel, and He saves a redeemed company of Gentiles during the Great Tribulation. Now, keeping before us, they thought that we're in a book that has been labeled a book difficult to understand and that it's just a mumbo-jumbo of a great deal of visions that are actually out of this world, most of them, and that no one can understand it. And we made the statement that this actually is the book that is more logical and is divided in a way that no one can miss it. In fact, in a very simple manner. And we have seen that the one thing, though, that is essential, this book happens to be the last book of the Bible. And so when you are studying in school, for instance, you begin with arithmetic, 2 plus 2 equal 4. Well, you don't start the little ones off today in first grade with atomic physics. And you don't start them off with higher mathematics. Well, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, and the only requirement is to have a working knowledge of 65 books that have gone before. When you do that, why, you'll find that this book makes a great deal of sense, and it's quite logical. Now, we're going to see that as we enter this chapter we have been looking at the opening of the seven seals. The only thing is, we've only had the opening of six seals so far. And we saw that the riding forth of those four horsemen of the apocalypse is the opening, beginning of the great tribulation period. And that we've come to a period in which the church is never mentioned by name. And the reason it's never mentioned by name is because they're recording things on earth, and at this particular time, the church is not on earth. In chapters 2 and 3, John was told to write the things you've seen. He saw the vision of the glorified Christ, and you to write the things that are. He was in the church period. We're still in it today. And I hope that we're in it today, because if the rapture's taken place, then you and I have been left. But I think the church is still in the world today, and we're in the things that are. Now the church is to be taken out of the world, and when it is, it won't be mentioned. It was the theme of chapters 2 and 3, the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamos, the church in Thyatira. But there's no talking to the church here because the church is not here on earth. We saw it in chapters 4 and 5. The church was in heaven. That's where the church had gone. And I'm going to deal later on why the church cannot go through the Great Tribulation period. There's actually a moral problem here, a theological problem if the church even entered one phase of the Great Tribulation period, so that the subject is changed. And we're talking about other things, and we will introduce the seven seals, a book with seven seals, and the seals are being removed. Six have been. Now, I think those four horsemen introduced the Great Tribulation period, and the seven seals give an overall picture of that seven-year period of the Great Tribulation period. And the last of the seals bear down on the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. We'll see how that's divided later on. But here you have brought before us up to this point the fact that one-fourth of the population of the earth was destroyed in judgment, actually destroyed in death. Now, I'm sure that anyone reading Revelation senses the fact that it's going to be very difficult to make it through this period. And especially if you turn to God, if you accept Christ, and if you stand for Him, 
The fact of the matter is, will you be able to stand during this period? And there are several questions that arise regarding this. Now, John's going to put down here another principle by which he'll follow, because he knows you and I are going to have trouble with Revelation. So he made it very simple for us. He introduces a series of seven. So we've already had that introduced at the beginning. Now, he has a book with seven seals. But the way that he deals with that is the important thing for us to see. That between the sixth and seventh seal, there is always introduced an interval where what would seem to be extraneous matter is brought in, but it is explanatory matter because it explains the action. It answers certain questions. And that's what this chapter is going to do for us, chapter 7, because we have the principle now put down that between the sixth and seventh of anything, it'll be true of the trumpets, it'll be true of the seven bowls of wrath and the seven persons that are introduced. And you'll always find John following this great principle all the way through this particular section of Revelation so that we don't lose our way. Now, I want to answer a question that would naturally arise. I'm sure that any reasonable person would raise this question at this time. Well, what about people getting saved? How about people turning to God during this period? Because somebody's going to say to me, now, when we were back in Second Thessalonians, you made it clear from that particular section that the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is removed from the earth. He has taken the church to present the church to Christ. And so you can't have any turning to God without the work of the Holy Spirit. So will anybody get saved, the Holy Spirit not being present? Well, friends... The Holy Spirit is present. Someone says, but that's not what you said. Oh, I didn't say that the Holy Spirit left the world. I said that he no longer restrained. You see, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to perform a specific ministry of calling out a body of believers in the church, and that is called the body of Christ. And when the church is removed, then that peculiar ministry of the Holy Spirit ends. And one of the ministries of this particular era was restraining. I think that it was absolutely essential that he be a restrainer because the gospel was going to penetrate a Satan-controlled and a Satan-blinded world. Unless the Spirit of God holds back evil, that the Word might go out, you see. Just think of the forces of evil that today are working against the getting out of the Word of God. I'm amazed the first year or two when we moved out here, we just sailed along like a breeze in this broadcast. And then problems came along, and then I got sick, and all of these things, and Finally, when we regained our equilibrium and began to look around, we said, what's happening? Well, the enemy was busy. And believe me, if the restrainer hadn't been at work, I'm sure that we would have been removed from the scene. Now, during the period of the Great Tribulation, how are people going to get saved then? Because he won't be restraining evil. The Great Tribulation is the devil's holiday. That's the day when he's going to have freedom to do as he pleases. And we're going to see why God's going to grant that. And it's a period of the judgment of God upon a Christ-rejecting world. So does anybody then get saved in the Great Tribulation? My friend, the greatest company, I believe, in any given period of time, this is a seven-year period, I believe there'll be more saved in that period than in any other period in the history of the world. I think that's going to be the great time. And someone says, how will it take place? Well, chapter 7 is going to tell us how. The Holy Spirit is in the world. He was in the world before Pentecost. 
you find the Spirit of God working in the Old Testament in the hearts and lives of men and women, and many multitudes were brought to God. But he was not restraining evil in the world. And he was not baptizing believers into the body of the church in the Old Testament. Now, that's what he's doing today. And that minister will cease, but he's in the business of getting men and women to Christ. And he'll have to have a special program, an unusual special program during this period. What's that program going to be? Well, he's going to tell us now. And I'm going to read at verse 1. I hope you have the authorized version. Actually, that's the only version I can honestly recommend today. I much prefer it with notes, however, but be that as it may, I do like to look at the other translations, and I've had the audacity to put in my book of Revelation my translation, although it's not a translation. I just attempted to bring literal words up and try to say what John was saying. And that's all. And I even made no attempt to put it in a form that would be grammatically accurate in English. I wanted it to be grammatically accurate out of the Greek. And that's my only excuse for doing what I've done. So will you listen now? And I'm going to read several verses here in order to get us into this chapter, but I won't be able to deal with all of them. Verse 1, after this, after what? Well, what we've been talking about. After there was this tremendous judgment, after the four horsemen rode, after this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding firmly the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2, now in 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the sunrising, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a great voice to the four angels, to whom it had been given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we shall have sealed the servants, that is, the bond slaves of our God, in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those sealed, a hundred and forty and four thousand sealed out of every tribe of the children of Israel. And I'm going to break off the reading there. That's the number from the nation Israel. But we'll see that out of the earth, there was a number of Gentiles. You couldn't even count them. There was so many of them that were saved. And I noticed that all the evangelists and all of us preachers today, we are able to give you the count. In fact, we may give you a count that may be a little bit larger than it really is. But here's one that they couldn't count. And I have to tell you, I'd like to know where the preacher evangelist is that couldn't count them today. But apparently in the Great Tribulation, there's going to be a great company that are to be saved. Now, how are they to be saved? They're going to be sealed. Sealed how? The Holy Spirit's going to be here not only to regenerate them, but he will have a special ministry of this spirit of sealing them. And what is a seal? Well, that guarantees they're going to be delivered. <laughs> you see, you go down and to a post office and you say, I want to register this letter. They stamp it there, put a seal on it. You pay a little extra for that. And they mean that the entire post office department are going to get back of that letter and see that it's delivered. All of them are back of Now, they may be a little late today getting it to you, but they guarantee they're going to get it to you. Now, that is what seal here means. They're sealed. The Holy Spirit guarantees they're going to make it through the Great Tribulation. And friend, if he wasn't there... To see them make it through, they wouldn't make it through. And if you really want to know the truth today, I feel like telling the truth. So I'll just say this. Vernon McGee wouldn't make it through today if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. I wonder if you and I realize how weak we are. Well, you know, I'd deny him before the sun went down on another day. 
if it wasn't for his work in me by the Spirit of God. Why, you know, we all have that nature that's in rebellion against God. So these people are going to be sealed. That's what we have just heard. Now we have an interlude. Before the seventh seal is open, here this angel is more than a sergeant. He's probably a lieutenant colonel or a general. He says, hold everything. He says, hold back the winds of judgment, the winds of the great tribulation, because we've got to seal these folk. They're going to make it through. And there'll be two great companies out of the nation, Israel and Gentiles. Somebody says, where's the church? Well, I just told you, the beginning, they're not here. They are with Christ, I think, in the new Jerusalem, because he said he was going to prepare a place for those that were his. And now that he's taken them out, Why, they're with him. And that city will come down from God out of heaven later on when we'll get a look at it. And I want to spend time with that because that's where I'm going to live throughout eternity. And I always like to know where I'm going to move to. And I don't know why. There's so many saints today, they talk about going to heaven, and they don't seem to know very much about where they're going. Well, may I say to you, the Bible really doesn't tell us much about it. But what it does say about it is very interesting and very important. And all that's in the book of Revelation. Now, that's the reason this book is very important. Now, let me come back to the text that I have read, verse 1. After this, we've already said, after the riding of the four horsemen, and I believe there we are given, as it were, a bird's eye view of the great tribulation period, an overall picture of it. And now the details are going to be given to us. And after this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. A smart aleck boy got up in a meeting years ago where Dr. Ironside was speaking, and he says, I told you the Bible was unscientific. He apparently had talked to Dr. Ironside before, and he says, why, the Bible teaches that the earth is flat because it says the four corners of the earth. And Dr. Ironside said, young man, I'm amazed. Didn't you know that the earth has four corners? The young man says, no, I didn't know the earth has four corners. What are they? He says, north, east, south, and west. That's the four corners of the earth, friends, you see. And that's the directions. The four angels, one in the north, east, south, and west. And they were holding firmly the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Now, these would be the winds of judgment. God uses wind in judgment, and he controls it. In Psalm 148, 8, it says, Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word. And so now the winds of judgment are to be held by Nothing can move now until God accomplishes his purpose. Now, what's his purpose going to be? I do not think God would permit any period to go on on this earth that there weren't some turning to God, because that's his purpose. I don't think he'd run this world. I think he'd shut it down, turn it off, speak it out of existence if there were not folk turning to him. And so this will be a period when multitudes will turn to him. Now we come to the second verse of the seventh chapter of Revelation. And I want to preface again my remarks by saying that we're not in a book that cannot be understood and that it's just a jumble of symbols. That is not accurate. There's no book that is so mathematically divided There is no book that the divisions are made clearer than they are in the book of Revelation. Now, if we get bogged down in some place and try to take symbols and juggle them to fit into any system that we might want to, then we're going to be in real trouble. But if we'll just let John tell us as we go along where we are, and we're now in a section that we have labeled the Great Tribulation, Well, I shouldn't say we labeled it. The Lord Jesus is the one who gave it that label. And this period takes place after the church leaves. 
It's the things that are after these things. That is, after the church concludes its mission and is taken to be with the law. Now, that, I think, is not only reasonable, but I personally feel that it's very clear. Not only here, but no prophecy is of any private interpretation. Peter says that is, you don't just lift out one verse or even the book of Revelation. And that's the reason the book is difficult, because it just happens to be the last book of the Bible, and there's 65 books come before it, And we ought to know a little about those books that come before it if we are to understand this book. That doesn't mean when we get down now into details, and John is going into details concerning the great tribulation period, or the period that has not been elaborated on in any place in the Scripture except in the Olivet Discourse that the Lord Jesus Christ gave. So John is merely widening out that and giving us additional information. And what he says is based on what the Lord Jesus had to say. Now, we saw that there were six seals open. And these six seals had for us, and I trust that they had for us, a real message and that they actually revealed the great plan of the Great Tribulation period. And these six seals open with the four great tragedies that are coming upon the earth, the beginning of the judgments, and then the fifth seal. Let us look at a martyred company of people. It was a great throng. And then the sixth seal, we were introduced to some of the signs of the coming doom that is to come upon a godless world in the Great Tribulation period. Now, the question arose, well, will anybody be saved in that period? We saw last time a great company is going to be saved. Actually, this will be a time that there will be nothing to correspond to it in the number of people that are saved. There's no other time period. That is seven years in which so many people turn to God. And it does reveal the fact that these judgments will accomplish a purpose for God. It will cause multitudes to turn to him in this period. It's going to cause another multitude to turn actually against him. You see, it's just like the effect, the illustration is, of the sun shining down upon a piece of soft clay. What will it do with it? It'll harden it. What will the effect of that same sunlight upon wax? Well, it'll melt it. It has the opposite effect. And so the judgments of God. And I feel that in our lives today as believers, when trouble comes to us, sickness, I've discovered in my own life that it'll either draw you to God or it'll drive you from Him. And we need to be drawn to Him. That's the reason I think the Lord's let some of us have sickness and trouble. He's wanted to draw us closer to Himself. And this was His way of doing it. Now, I want to look here at this first company that are going to be saved during the Great Tribulation period. And we can't explain every little detail here, at least I can. I get a little irritated and provoked that I don't know as much as some of these so-called prophetic teachers today because they seem to have a private line into the Lord. They know now the date when the Lord is coming. They're great at that. And not only that, but... Actually, they can interpret some passages in a most amazing fashion where the Scripture says that the blood will be up to the bridal bits in the war of Armageddon. Why, some of these fellows can tell you the type of blood it is. My, they irritate me because I don't seem to be able to get that kind of information. And then I actually wonder what the value of it is after you get it. And to begin with, The church ought to understand clearly that we have been delivered from judgment. We're not going through this period at all. The Lord Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath right now eternal life and shall not come into judgment. And the great tribulation is a judgment. 
and we're not coming into it. He said so. And he made it clear to the church of Philadelphia. He said, I'm going to deliver you from that hour. What hour? Well, he's talking about it now. Oh, if we would only let the Scripture speak for itself. Now, I'm going to let it speak for itself because I'm doing a great deal of talking right here and haven't read anything yet. Verse 2 and 3, I'm reading them. I hope you have your authorized version because I'm reading now my miserable trans... And I ought not to call it a translation. I merely just attempted to translate the words out of the original. Will you listen to it? And I saw another angel ascending from the sun rising, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a great voice to the four angels to whom it had been given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we shall have sealed the servants are the bond slaves of our God in their foreheads. All right. Now, another angel here means there's a fifth angel. And he apparently is of a higher rank than the other four because he gives them orders. And as we saw in the book of Daniel, and we saw it also in the epistle to the Ephesians, that there are gradation of orders of angels, both good and bad that Satan has the demon world well organized. He has generals, and he has lieutenant colonels, and majors, and, and he has lieutenant, and then a sergeant, and then a great many privates. And so we have on the other side, God as his arranged. So this angel gives orders to the other four. Now, it says here he did it with a great voice. And in the Greek, that is phone. Megaly. Now, if you turn phone, megaly, around, you have megaphone. That's where we get our word megaphone. Mega means great, phony noise or voice. And here it's an indication that it's with frightful and fearful judgment that is getting ready to break upon the earth. And it's therefore necessary to secure the servants of God. If he doesn't seal them, they're not going to make it through. Now, they are to be preserved in this day of wrath that's coming on the earth. And the Lord Jesus himself mentioned this. He says in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22, "...for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be." And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For the sake of these that have been sealed. Now, this is a terrible time. Now, what is the mark that was put on their forehead? Now, here is a place where I must confess. And I sure hope you won't let this get out. We want to keep this just to ourselves. Because there's some people think I know what that mark is. I don't know what it is. I can only make suggestions here. Now, I recognize there are many that know what that mark is. But the interesting thing is that you can't get any two to agree what it is. So some of them must be wrong. I've come to the conclusion they're all wrong on that. And why? Because we're not told what it is. I don't think it's important for the church today, to even know what the mark is. We're just told that they're going to be marked. Now, what kind of a mark? I don't know. Now, we are told that there are those that will not be able to trade during this period when Antichrist comes into power unless they have the mark of the beast. Uh, This mark is in contrast to it. But my feeling is that this is a spiritual mark that will be in the lives of those. By their fruits ye shall know them, by their lives. And I believe that's going to be the mark of God's own in this period, because the godless are really going to be godless in this period. And I personally don't see how they can be any more godless than the godless are in Los Angeles today, or as the world is getting today. But the Word of God says they can go lots farther than they've gone even in our day. Now, God is going to save a remnant of Israel. 
Now, we had given first in this chapter, and let me show you how simple even a chapter like this is divided. I have in my book here three divisions of this chapter. You have the reason for the interlude between the sixth and seventh seals. Why? The seal leaves to make sure that they're going to make it through. And the Lord Jesus made it very clear that they're going to make it through, that they are going to come through. We begin now here at verse 4, the remnant of Israel sealed. And then in verses 9 through 17, a redeemed multitude of Gentiles. This is the three R's of Revelation. Not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the reason for the interlude, the remnant of Israel and the redeemed multitude of Gentiles. Now look at the remnant of Israel. When God deals with Israel, I've always noticed he'll deal with dates and he'll deal with numbers. When he's dealing with the church, he never deals with dates or numbers. And that's the reason that we never announce on this program that we had so many saved in a certain year. Now, I had one of the young ladies that runs our robotype machine. She brought me in a clipping, and I have it here somewhere, that we had at that time 15 letters from folk that said they had been saved through the program. And I, at that time, thought, my, this will be a good time for us to start putting down numbers and handing out figures. Well, I began to think that after the day of Pentecost, you never had any numbers given. Paul never turned in a report to anybody how many were saved. And we're told when we get even to this great company of Gentiles, the number's not given. But when you deal with Israel, God deals with numbers and he deals with dates when he's dealing with them, but not with the church. And that's the reason today I think that this matter of date setting is hurt the study of prophecy, and brought it down to a low level, whereas this subject ought to be kept on as high a level as any other subject of prophecy. Now he says here in verse 4, and I'm still reading from my translation, "...and I heard the number of those sealed, a hundred and forty and four thousand, sealed out of every tribe of the children of Israel." Now, this company can be identified without any speculation whatsoever. And to me, it's almost nonsense for any group to come along and say, we are the 144,000. Now, two of the cults did that in the beginning, and then they passed 144,000. They apparently were not very optimistic when they started out, but now they pass that number. And you don't hear them mention it anymore because they say they take it literally, and yet they don't now because they pass that number. They just should have gone out of business when they got 144,000, but they didn't. They just kept right on going. But the interesting thing is it does not refer to any group today or the church or any at all. It's during the Great Tribulation... 144,000 are to be saved, and it's out of every tribe of Israel. So that if you are in the 144,000, you're not only say that you belong to Israel, but you better identify your tribe, or you'd have to, because that's going to be done. Now, we need to make that very clear, that God will have a remnant of his people that are going to be saved. Now, that may seem to you like a big number. Actually, it's very small. There are about 12 million today in the world, I think. It got down to 10 million under Hitler. It was up to 16 million. But in contrast to that number, you can see the remnant is going to be really very small of the children of Israel, comparatively speaking, very small. But we need to be clear There's no use speculating here and trying to draw on symbols. There are some even that say that the number, 144,000, is a symbol of another number. Well, can't God say what he wants to say? Can he count? Certainly he can. When he says 144,000, I don't think he means 145,000. I think he means exactly that. 
And then there are to be out of every tribe of Israel. Now, there are some things here that we need to know. That this remnant has always been true. From the day he called Abraham, there's always been the remnant. There's a remnant today in the church. I know many wonderful Christian Jews. And I don't know why I say that, because I don't say Christian Americans or Christian Germans, but we do say it of Israel because of the fact there is that remnant today. And again, not a large remnant, but there's not a very large remnant of Gentiles. I suppose the great minority group today are real believers in Christ. Now, Paul says in Romans 9, 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. See, that's true today. Now, in Romans 11, 4 and 5, he says, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul said in his day, there's a remnant today that are in the church in his day. Now, there's a remnant in our day that's in the church and just a remnant of Gentiles to tell the truth. Now, during the great tribulation, here is the remnant and the numbers given. Now, we are told that These are the ones that are going to witness in the great tribulation period. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, "...and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come." Now, he was talking about the great tribulation period and the gospel of the kingdom. Somebody says, oh, that's a different gospel. Of course not. God's never had but one way to save sinners. That's through the death of Christ. If you had asked Abel when he brought that little lamb to God and said to him, Abel, do you think that little lamb will save you? He was an intelligent man. He said, no, this little lamb is pointing down because God told my mother that there was coming from her line, from a woman, one that would be the Savior of the world. And this little lamb points to him. And John the Baptist stepped out of character almost when he said to Behold, a Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. That's going to alert the nation Israel. And many will turn to Christ, and they'll preach that. But they'll have something to say that we have no right to say. They say it's not going to be long till he'll be back here. They'll be able to say that. We have no right to say that at all because we know not the day nor the hour when he shall come. Now, these are divided into tribes here, and we're told how much are in each tribe. Now, I'm going to deal with that. It's a little tedious and technical, but I intend to go through with it. And then to try to show why we today need to be very careful of being dogmatic where the Word of God does not Give us the answer. Now, the Word of God never told us what the mark is going to be in that day on believers, those that will be God's servants. Frankly, I don't know what it'll be. I want to read to you now, beginning with verse 5, read down through verse 8. It says, "...of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Reuben 12,000, tribe of Gad, 12,000, tribe of Asher, 12,000, tribe of Naphtali, 12,000, tribe of Manasseh, 12,000, tribe of Simeon, 12,000, tribe of Levi, 12,000, of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000, tribe of Zebulun, 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed, 12,000. Now, 12,000 out of each tribe so that the 144,000 are divided by 12, and one-twelfth is in each tribe, so that we know we're talking about the children of Israel. I don't see how anyone can spiritualize this 
and attempt to appropriate either to themselves or to some other group than the children of Israel. Because God had promised, as we've seen again and again in the Old Testament, that he would bring them through this time of trouble, this great day of the Lord, and he would come and establish the kingdom, which we're going to see is first a thousand-year kingdom, for it's a time of testing, and then it moves right into eternity. We have here given these 12 tribes, and one writer says there 13 times in the Bible, that the twelve tribes are given. And another writer says 18. I don't know which it is. I frankly didn't feel like that was worthwhile determining. But in every case where the twelve tribes are given, it's always twelve tribes. Now, sometimes changes are made. And I can't always determine what the change is. I can in some cases, but in some, I'm not always clear in my own thinking. But I know God had something in mind when he did. Now, there are these peculiarities here, and I'm going to call attention to them. And I hope this is not nitpicking. I think it's important and significant, but I don't think it's essential to go into detail concerning these 12 tribes. Now, first of all, You will notice that Judah heads the list. The tribe of Reuben should come first, for Reuben was the oldest. But because of his sin, and if you want to check on that sin, it's back in Genesis, the 49th chapter, verse 4. And because of that very gross immorality on the part of Reuben, he lost first place, but he didn't lose out. Now, the question arises, when a Christian sins, does he lose his salvation? No, but he may lose his reward. Very frankly, there will be many Christians that they are saved, but they indulged in sin, and they'll lose their reward. And Reuben here is a very good example of how God deals, and this principle is set down here. Reuben lost first place. He lost the place of honor, but he didn't lose out altogether because he's given here, but he's number two. He should have been number one. And it was from the tribe of Judah that the Lord Jesus came. Then we find here that the tribes of Dan and Ephraim were omitted from this list. Both of these tribes were guilty of going into idolatry. If you would turn to Deuteronomy, the 29th chapter, verses 18 through 21, you would find that the tribe of Dan went into idolatry and the tribe of Ephraim. Because there in Moses' great prophecy, why that is mentioned, Then in history, you will find that Dan was the first tribe that fell into idolatry. Now, that's found in Judges, the 18th chapter, verse 30. And very frankly, the tribe of Dan became later on the headquarters for calf worship because we're told Jeroboam made Israel to sin. And that's found in 1 Kings, the 12th chapter, 28 to 30. They are given top priority in the millennium. And in Ezekiel, the 48th chapter, you will find out that the tribe of Dan is in the millennium. But they weren't sealed for the time of the great tribulation. And that reveals that the grace of God can reach down and meet the need of any sinner. And though they were not sealed for the purpose of witnessing, and I think, again, this tribe lost out a great deal. Now, Ephraim was also guilty of idolatry. Many of you will recall not too long ago when we studied Hosea that Ephraim was given over to idols. And fact of the matter is, God says, Let him alone because of the fact he had turned and had gone into idolatry. I think probably I will turn and read that verse. It's found in the fourth chapter, verse 17 of Hosea. 
Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Now, that has reference to the northern kingdom, but remember that Ephraim was the leader there. And Ephraim was the tribe which led in the division of the kingdom in 1 Kings eleven twenty six. And now, in this list, Joseph takes the place of Ephraim. And we have to take the place of Dan, Levi. And I think the reason that Levi is given is because Levi was the priestly tribe, and they are going to be witnesses in the Great Tribulation period. And it's quite proper for them to be witnesses in the Great Tribulation period. Now, I trust that we can understand and see here that now God has turned again to the nation Israel. He'd not given them up. He'd said to Ephraim, O Ephraim, how can I give thee up? God says, I can't do it. And God didn't give them up. They are going to make it through the great tribulation period, even though they lost out as witnesses for God during that period. The 144,000 are sealed, especially because they're going to witness during this period. And it's going to cost them a great deal. And if they weren't sealed, they sure wouldn't be able to make it through. You see, God never leaves himself without a witness on this earth. Now we have brought before us another company of redeemed. It's a redeemed multitude of Gentiles. Now I'm going to read verses 9 through 10. Will you listen to this? After these things I saw, and remember, he is seeing as well as hearing at this particular place. After these things I saw, and behold, a great multitude which no man could number. Now, someone says, uh, you mean to tell me that men couldn't count that crowd? Well, it doesn't say that. It says no one man could number these. And it doesn't say anything about a computer or an IBM machine. But it says no one man could number this crowd because it's such a large crowd. And I wouldn't dare to venture any number whatsoever. But it must be a very large crowd or they could be numbered, which no man could number. Out of every nation and out of tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, arrayed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and they cry with a great voice, saying, "'The salvation to our God, who sitteth on the throne,' And to the Lamb. Now, obviously, the size of this multitude is stupendous. It's not a one man job to number them. And these are Gentiles, people from every tribe and nation under the sun. That means that the gospel of the kingdom and the great tribulation will be preached throughout the world. I want to repeat this. The witnesses, these 144,000 in the Great Tribulation period, are going to do in seven years what the church up to the present has not done in 1,900 years. So don't boast about your missionary program. None of us are reaching too many. But during the Great Tribulation, there will be a great company of people. Now, I personally want to add this, and it's my own private judgment, and you can take it for what it's worth, which is not very much. But I do believe that before the church leaves, and I don't think he says it anywhere, because nothing has to be fulfilled before he removes the church, but it looks to me like now he's going to let the world hear the gospel before the rapture of the church. And I believe that radio is one of the mediums that will be used. I think there are other mediums that are being used today that are 
fantastic. The tape ministry, our tape ministry now almost equals our radio ministry, the printed page, and then the evangelism today. Many evangelists are just reaching multitudes of people today, and other radio programs are doing a much bigger job than we are doing. But you put us all together, we're making quite an impact on this world in which we live. Now, here is a great company that have come out of the Great Tribulation period. This great company, they are rejoicing in their salvation, and they've been saved during the Great Tribulation period. And again, may I say, the greatest days of God's salvation are in the future. And they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And that indicates that they are redeemed. And it indicates they've made it through the Great Tribulation period. Now, the white robes here set before us the righteousness of Christ in which they're clothed. Because we couldn't stand before God in our own righteousness, our own righteousness of filthy rags. And I don't think you're going to have filthy rags in the presence of God. And the palm branches here, literally in the Greek, that's palm trees. And that is the sign of victory. Victory in Christ. This multitude is part of that great triumphal entry. When Christ returns to the earth, really the triumphal entry has never taken place. That actually was more like a triumphal exit. When he came into Jerusalem, he's getting ready to leave, you see, the earth, because he was on the way to the cross at that time. But since then, might has been a great company. And in the Great Tribulation, there's going to be another great company. And when he returns to the earth, this great company that were martyred for him, that died for him in the Great Tribulation, and we're going to see later on there, included in the first resurrection, they're going to be there. Now, this is a wonderful, glorious picture that's given to us. Now, notice verses 11 and 12, and I'll read them in my translation. And all the angels were standing around the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be under our God forever and ever. You know, this is a fabulous, fantastic scene that's before us here. This universal worship of God by his creatures, and the angels join in on it. The church is here. The Old Testament saints are here. And these are different companies. And the tribulation saints are here. And now the angels join this. Now, there are just one or two things I'd like to say about the angels, and I don't want to labor the point, and I wouldn't contend with anybody about it. But you know, nowhere in Scripture does it say that angels sing. And I like that because I can't sing either, but I'm no angel. But the point is, I think I'm going to stand with them. They're saying this here. Now, I'm not going to contend with you. If you think angels sing, you just keep right on thinking it. It's perfectly all right. But the important thing to note here, and this is important, the other company, they thank God for their redemption, (laughs) the salvation of our God. (laughs) But the angels don't mention it. Well, why don't they mention it? Well, they praise God for his attributes and goodness but not for salvation. Why? They are sinless creatures, not redeemed sinners. And I don't think they're going to be able to sing. But I do believe Vernon McGee will be able to sing in that day. I can't do it now, but I sure will be able to sing with that great company. Friends, I hope that this will begin to broaden your vision and your comprehension of what heaven's going to be. A great many people think that the only folk going to be in heaven is their little group or their little denomination. Well, my friends, there are going to be other redeemed people there besides even the church. I think that's going to surprise a lot of the saints to discover that when they get to heaven. I wish we could discover it down here 
it would give us, I think, a greater love for God and lead us to worship him more in a very real way. Worship him in spirit and truth today. Now, the church, you can see, is not here. The church was mentioned just again and again in chapters 2 and 3, and all of a sudden it disappeared. What happened to it? Well, it left the earth and went to heaven because we see it now, no longer a church, but the 24 elders in heaven. And from here on, the church is just not mentioned. It's not the subject at all. If you were overhearing a conversation that was taking place in the room next to you, and you hear somebody talking to somebody named Bill, and it was Bill this, Bill that, Bill something else. And then all of a sudden, you hear Bill say, well, hello, Bob, and apparently Bob is coming to the room. And so Bob says, hello, Bill, and then you see Bob talking to the others in the room, And Bill is not mentioned again. Now, don't you assume that maybe Bill left the room and Bob came into the room? Well, when you leave chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, and the church is not mentioned anymore, you assume it's not there. Or if it is, you certainly forgot all about it, and it was very important. But somebody else is mentioned. Bob is coming to the room, and Bill is left. The church is gone, and God now has returned to the nation Israel. And the Old Testament is just filled with prophecies, as we've seen and as we've gone through, that God had given them there to be a nation forever. They are to be in a land forever. And the fact that you can come to the New Testament and write them off as having disappeared and that God's through with them, You have to contradict the whole tenor and tone of the Old Testament. Well, here they are. (laughs) I told you that the book of Revelation is like a great Union station where trains come in or an airport where planes come in. They come in from everywhere. And all the major themes of prophecy come into Revelation. Well, now, you would certainly expect Israel to be here in the book of Revelation. And lo and behold, here it is. And Israel's Israel. Now, if God had wanted to call Israel the church, I think he would have just said church because he was able to say church when the time came. Now the church is not mentioned anymore, and he's talking about Israel and 144,000 sealed a witness for him. And then a great company of Gentiles now are to be saved during this period. Obviously, witnessed to by the 144,000. And the thing that makes it extremely interesting is that they made it through the Great Tribulation period. They were sealed, and they got through the Great Tribulation period. Now, we find them standing before the throne. I think that we've moved now to the end of the Great Tribulation, and I think most of them were martyred during that period, but they endured to the end. Why? The Lord Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, speaking of this same period, he says, they that endure to the end, they'll be saved. Well, are they going to endure to the end because they gritted their teeth and sort of clenched their fists and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps? No, they didn't do it at all. They were sealed, you see. And here's a great company of Gentiles, and they're making it through. We also saw that in the great praise that this great company gave to God before the throne and to the Lamb on the throne, why they were joined by a great angelic host. And they praised God not for salvation, because they are sinless creatures, they were not redeemed, but because of his wisdom, his attributes of goodness and power and all of that, and that he's worthy of praise and adoration. One of the elders wants to bring John up to date on what's taking place. Now I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Let me read. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, These which are arrayed in the white robes, who are they? 
and whence came they? And I say unto him, My Lord, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is a very enlightening passage of Scripture, as you can see. One of the elders went over to John, and he says, John, who are these here that are arrayed in these white robes? And John says, Sir, thou knowest, or my Lord, thou knowest, as we have attempted to put it in the original. My Lord, thou knowest. In other words... This is an idiomatic expression. I think we have one that would match it. Somebody asks us a question, we don't know the answer, and we just sort of lift our hands and we say, search me, which means I don't know. And that's exactly what John is saying here. My Lord, thou knowest. You know I don't know. You tell me, because I don't know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. Now, If these people that are gathered here had been the church, don't you know that John would have known it? John wrote to the believers in his day. He knew about the church. He knew about the body of believers. And he talked about that great unifying cement that holds them together. The love of God means that they must love one another. And that we saw was demonstrated, and I read a little poem about that the other day to you. Now, John doesn't know who they are. In other words, John at this point is, frankly, an amillennialist. He doesn't know who this company is. And so the elder who represents the church knows. And this company is not one of them. It's an altogether different company. It's those that came out of the great tribulation. And doesn't that tell you that the church is not going through the great tribulation? This is a special company out of all tribes and tongues and nations that have come out of the great tribulation. We live today when God makes a division in the human family. One division is saved and lost, of course. That's the great bifurcation of the human family. But if you want a group division, you will recall that the Word of God has something to say about it. We are told in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, and I'd like to read that to you. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10. 1032, Paul says to the Corinthians, there are three groups over there. There are Jews, and there are Gentiles, and there is the church of God. Those are the three groups. And don't give an offense to any one of these groups. That's what he's saying to the Corinthians. That is one of the divisions that the Scripture makes of the human family. There are Jews, there are Gentiles. And there's the church of God. That is the division today that runs right down through the human family. Now, we've come to a period when there's not but two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Where's the church of God? It went to be with him. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. They're with him now, you see. This peculiar group, which he mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. So God today is calling out of the two divisions, both Jews and Gentiles, a people for his name that are different, the church. And that church will be taken out of the world. I don't like the impression given today by some, and it is a pessimistic viewpoint, that somehow or another today, God is failing. My friend, God today is doing exactly what he said he was going to do, that in this age he would call a people 
out of this world to himself. And he's doing a lot better job at that than you and I think he is. In fact, as a pastor of a church, I didn't think he was doing very much. But I've discovered on radio as we've reached out across this land and now around the world, why we have discovered that there are multitudes that are turning to Christ today everywhere. And that's what others are reporting so that God's calling the people out of this world to himself, the church. Now, the church is not here. John makes it clear. This is a group different from the church. They came through the great tribulation. Now, where in the world have we heard about the great tribulation before? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that uses this term. In fact, he's the one that gave it to us. Somebody thinks that maybe some rank, wild-haired fundamentalist thought of that term, but he didn't. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that thought of it and designated it. And he makes the statement in Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, "...and then shall be the great tribulation." And here in Matthew and also in Revelation... There is a way of expressing it that we just can't do it in our language. There is an article with the adjective great and an article with tribulation. And it's the tribulation, the great one. And that is given to us for emphasis. In other words, this is something that's different. This is something that is indeed unusual. And so John is here quizzed by one of the elders. And he's unable to identify this great company. John would have known them if this was the church, but it's not. And if they were Old Testament saints or Israelites, I think John would have known that. This company he does not recognize at all. And they are identified as redeemed Gentiles who've come out of the great tribulation And their robes, which speaks of the righteousness of Christ, how did they get it? Because Christ shed his blood. And that's the only way in the world that you and I will be able to stand before God. It's because he paid the penalty for our sins. He died that you and I might live. And that is true of this group here also. God has only one way of saving mankind. It's always been true, and that's by faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let me read a couple uh, scriptures to you in this connection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul tells us what the gospel is. Let me read it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. If your faith was an empty faith, and not put now in the gospel, you're not saved. But now if you've trusted, what? Now what is the gospel? Listen to him. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received." Paul says, this is not new with me. I never thought of it. It was given to me that Lord Jesus taught him out yonder in that Arabian desert for two years. And he says that he is giving them what he had received, how that Christ died for what? For our sins, according to the Scriptures, according to the Old Testament, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, this is the gospel. The gospel is not God asking you to do something. It's God telling you that he has done something for you. The gospel is not you giving something to God. The gospel is God giving something to you. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. How do you get it? By faith. That's the only way you can receive a gift. Suppose you bring in here a gift to me, and maybe by Christmas, while you come in here and you say, Dr. McGee, here's a gift for you. Now, what did I have to do to receive it? I couldn't say to you, I'll come out and mow your lawn. (laughs) But you'd say, well, I don't want you to do that. By the way, 
many of you, when you hear this, will wonder why I mentioned mowing the lawn. In California, I have to mow my lawn in November. And so I say, I'll mow your lawn. You say, I don't want you to mow it. This is a gift. I'd insult you if you brought me a gift and I'd try to pay you for it. Suppose I'd say, well, I've got three cents in my pocket. I'll give you this for it. Well, that would be an insult because I know you wouldn't give me a gift that just costs three cents. You see, friends, the things got all mixed up today. The gospel is what God is doing for us, you see. Now, he says again in Ephesians 1, 7, "...in whom," that is, in Christ, "...we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace." God's got plenty of grace, and I don't care who you are, he can save you. Now, we have here this great company that's not part of the church, and we need to enlarge our conception of the redeemed to the extent that it goes beyond the borders of the church today, and certainly beyond the borders of your little group or my little group or your denomination or mine. Now, verses 15 and 17, I'm reading in my translation now, and this brings the chapter to an end. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And I know now good and well that it's not the church. The church is never identified with a temple. And we're told when we see at the end of this book, the church in heaven, in the New Jerusalem, there's no temple there. The church will never have a temple. There's going to be one here on the earth, but there's not one in heaven where the church is. So this couldn't be the church, you see. And he that sitteth on the throne shall spread his tabernacle or tent over them for protection, you see. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike upon them, nor any heat or scorching wind, that is. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them into fountains of waters of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, this company, they've had it. They've been through a great tribulation period. Most of them, I think, martyrs lay down their lives for Christ, although we're not specifically told that, but they are presented to us as being before the throne of God in heaven. And the things that are mentioned now are things they endured. They're not going to hunger or thirst. They apparently did. They've been out in the burning heat of the sun. And they also have been thirsty for spiritual things, and they didn't have that, and they wept. Now God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And they've made it through the great tribulation because of the blood of the Lamb, this wonderful company that's presented to us here. You see, he has other sheep. He told his apostles, it is hard for them to get it. I have other sheep that you don't know anything about. They're not of this fold. He has other sheep. And he could say that to the church. I have other sheep that you don't know anything about. And here are some of the other sheep, by the way, that have been redeemed. But it's not the church. I trust we've made that clear. Now, we come to the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. And the eighth chapter, we have the opening of the seventh seal And the opening of the seventh seal introduces the seven angels blowing seven trumpets. And four of the trumpets are in this chapter here. And we see that after we've had the parenthetical matter that we had in the seventh chapter of the sealing of two companies, now we have the opening of the seals resumed again. Only the seventh seal remains to be opened. Now, this, as we have called your attention to before, is the outline of the pattern that John puts down for us. So we cannot be led astray. He will move like this. There will be a series of sevens. In fact, four are coming up that relate to the Great Tribulation period. And he will give six of whatever the series might be. 
then he will have a parenthetical matter that contributes to the understanding of that particular series. And then he comes to the opening of the seventh, whatever it is, a seal or the blowing of a trumpet, and that in itself will introduce the next series of sevens, which means that they are interrelated, that they are tied together. They belong actually to the same period. And so we have now the opening of the seventh seal that introduces the seven angels with the seven trumpets. And this sets the pattern for the remainder of the book of Revelation. Before the seventh of any series is introduced, a subsidiary subject is introduced to provide more light on the particular series. Now, I Repeat that because I think it's important for us to see. And there's no reason now to get bogged down. And there's no reason to be sensational at this point. To begin with, when we got to chapter 4, we said everything from here on is future. The things that shall be after these things, John says. Now, we are in that section. Now, if we're living in the things that are present, which is the church age then these things do not concern us in the sense a great many people say, oh, it frightens me to study the book of Revelation. Well, friends, if you're afraid now of these series that are coming up, and I'll admit, beginning with the writing of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, these are terrible, terrific judgments that are coming on this earth. And frankly, they are so tremendous that they boggle the mind just to read about them. But we at least can know where we are. This is something that will take place after the church. And if you're a child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And to be delivered to him when the church goes out of the world before the great tribulation period. That's what's called the blessed hope of the church. Now... These seven trumpets will bring us to the full intensity of the great tribulation. These seven seals bring judgments, which are the natural results of the activities of sinful man apart from God. The sixth seal brings the judgment of nature. And the seven trumpets reveal that God is judging directly and supernaturally a rebellious race. Now, the first four series of sevens can be explained this way. And I'd like to mention this because these next four, in fact, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, then we'll have seven personalities, and then seven vials or bowls of wrath. All of these concern the same period, but from just a little different angle. In the seven seals, You have judgment, which is the result of man's willful activity. And I think this new movement that is abroad today, which glorifies sex, to engage in sex orgies, this is the thing that, of course, characterized the pagan religions of the past. It was especially true in places like Ephesus and Corinth. Sex, there was a religion, and that's what many of these new groups that are rising today, it's just old paganism coming back, indulging in sex, and calling it religion. This is, to my judgment, a very dangerous thing, and it is satanic. Well, this is the period in which all of that will really abound, you see. But the judgment of God will be coming upon man sinful man because of this. We had the riding of the white horse, a false peace. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And then with the red horse of war. Who makes war? Man makes war. How does war come? Because it's in the heart of man. If you took all the guns away from all the people and there was no arms and no atom bombs or anything like that. A great many people think if we can get rid of all of that, then we're going to have peace on the earth. My friend, war is in the heart of man. 
And you'd have to change the heart of man before you can get rid of war. Very frank with you, I've got more confidence in a real a born-again Christian who has a gun than an unsaved man who does not have a gun. Because if he can't get a gun, I tell you, he'll claw you to death. Uh, he'll choke. He'll do anything. We see today a great deal of that being manifested. Now in the seven trumpets we are coming to now, you have the judgment, which is the direct activity of God. And when we get to the seven personalities, we have the judgment, which is the result of Satan's fight against God. Satan will be brought out in the open at that time. And then in the seven bowls of wrath, we have the final judgment of the great tribulation, which is the direct activity of God because of man's and Satan's rebellion. And God will judge both, by the way. Now, we are coming to a section in which we'll find symbols used. But let's remember that a symbol is a symbol of a fact. You can't dissolve it into thin air because it's a symbol. And we're going to find here that there's a strange and strong similarity between the plagues of Egypt in Moses' day and the trumpet judgments. And I think that it's quite reasonable and logical to conclude that if the plagues in Moses' day, if they were literal, then the plagues that are coming in the Great Tribulation are going to be literal. And the symbols that are used are symbols of the reality of what's coming. In other words, plain language would not make it clear to our minds how terrible and tragic the Great Tribulation is. In other words, it beggars description. And so, as it were, God exhausts language and brings in symbols. But when you say symbols, don't try to dissolve it away. It's well to keep in mind that this book here is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And we see him now in a new role of judge. And these judgments here, the symbols that are used, they're not hazy and shadowy symbols which can be dissipated in the thin air by some specious system of hermeneutics. When symbols are used, and they are used in this book, the key is supplied. Scripture will furnish the explanation. And don't draw on your imagination. You don't need to. Revelation is the last book in the Bible because a knowledge, a working knowledge of 65 books precedes it, and it's the basic requirement for an understanding of its vivid language. I, today, get a little irritated to see somebody get saved or a new Christian, and they immediately start a class in the book of Revelation and start teaching Revelation. Why don't you go back and start with Genesis? If you want to begin at the beginning, that's where you should go. Or take some other book. Don't take Revelation to begin with. Remember, we've been now almost five years going through the Bible. Now, I believe that gives us the right to teach the book of Revelation. And I wouldn't want it otherwise. And it was Peter that says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, you don't interpret Revelation by itself. There are 65 books back of it, and the symbols are going to be given to us, but they are not going to be dissolved into thin air. You're not going to wipe them out. You can't just wipe them out. You can't just wash it away. The symbol stands for an awful reality, and we need to recognize that. Now, we have here the opening of the seventh seal, and that introduces the seven trumpets. That's the way that this entire book is built. The structure of the book, if it's fallen, will prevent you from going off into fanaticism and sensationalism. And it certainly, as a Christian, ought to keep you from saying, oh, the book of Revelation, it's so frightful, 
It terrifies me. It ought not to terrify you. It ought to actually be a comfort to you. I thank God that this world that's running wild today, and actually it looks like that it's filled with madmen the way that mankind has so blundered and gotten this world in a mess today. I thank God he's going to judge it, friends, and he's going to judge it right when he moves in. That's very comforting today to recognize that. That's not my business to get on here and denounce everything else. My business is just to give out the word, and that's what I'm going to do. He's going to straighten it out someday. I wouldn't have that job for anything in the world. I'm glad it's his job. He's going to straighten this world out, and he's going to move in in judgment. Now, maybe you don't like that, that fact he's going to judge, that the gentle Jesus, and we've already seen the wrath of the Lamb. It was terrifying to those on earth. And my friend, when you talk about the gentle Jesus, you better get acquainted with him. He died for you. He loves you. He wants to save you. But if you won't have him, I tell you, there is waiting ahead of you a terrifying judgment. Now, somebody says, oh, you're trying to frighten people. Well, I'd like to scare you into heaven if I could. I'll be honest with you. But I know you're too sophisticated today for that. And there are too many cynics today. But my beloved judgment is coming on this earth. And I say hallelujah. I'm glad it's coming because I'm glad God's not going to let it go on like it is now. It's gone long enough. Now, I want to read the first verse of the eighth chapter. And whenever he opened the seventh seal, there came to pass silence in heaven of about a half hour. Now, I read that from my translation, which I don't recommend, but I've given you the literal of what John wrote. Now, there is silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. Many years ago now, when I was considered a young people's speaker, I've long since passed that stage, I was at a young people's conference here in Southern California, and there were three or four hundred young people there. And I was out on the grounds of the camp, and I saw coming toward me a group of girls, and in the middle of them, and there was a boy, and it looked like they were going to take him apart. They were making a great deal of noise about it, too. I couldn't tell what it was, and finally they came up to me, and they wanted me to hear what this fellow had to say. And he said to me, he said, Dr. McGee, did you know that there are not going to be any women in heaven? And I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, do you have Scripture for it? And he said, yes, there's Scripture for it. He says, it says there's going to be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And he says, if there are any women there, there couldn't be any silence for that long. Well, now, may I say to you, I think the young man was rather, you know, <clears throat> probably a little prejudiced, but he sure was surrounded with a bunch of girls, and they were attempting to correct him on that particular interpretation. And I frankly agree with the girls that that's not the meaning here at all. It doesn't mean that there are not going to be any women in heaven. Now, as we open this passage, and may I say that I opened it on that very light note, probably I did wrong. Because here is a passage that has to do with great solemnity and great seriousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is still in command. He opens the seventh seal. And there is introduced a fanfare of seven trumpets. He directs the action now from heaven. He's in charge. And what's taking place, he is directing. We need to keep that before us through the entire book. Don't lose sight of the fact that Revelation presents him in his glory as the judge of all the earth. You see, it may deceive you to just have it presented to you that he's the gentle Jesus that went about doing good, and he did. But you see, the one who's the lamb, we're going to have the wrath of the lamb someday. But the lamb is the one that, as John says, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the world is not lost, actually, 
because they're sinners. They're lost because they've rejected Jesus because he died for you. And I don't care, even if you go into a, a lost eternity and you haven't accepted Christ, he died for you, friends. And you just made it of no avail. You made what he did at the cross a ridiculous, a senseless sort of thing. And you've trodden underfoot the blood of Christ when you take that kind of attitude and position toward him. And so this is a very solemn scene. He orders a halt on all fronts, heaven, hell, and earth. Nothing can move without his permission. He'd already ordered the cessation of natural forces on the earth when he ordered the sealing and saving of two definite groups. Now, for a brief moment, there is a lull in judgment activity. There is a heavenly hush. Godet defined it like this, and I'm quoting him. This silence is a pause of action. I like that. This silence is a pause of action. It is the lull before the storm. Why this strange silence? Well, his patience is not exhausted. When the sixth seal was opened and nature responded with a mighty convulsion, brave men weakened for a moment. Christ gave them opportunity to repent. But like Pharaoh of old, when the heat was taken off, his willful heart returned to its original intention. So many men will go back to their blasphemous conduct when there's a calm. They probably will even rebuke themselves for showing a yellow streak. After all, it was only nature reacting. It wasn't God after all. And everything can be explained by natural causes. That's what they'll say. This, my friend, is the lull before the storm. As someone has said, the steps of God from mercy to judgment are always slow, reluctant, and measured. That's the end of the quotation. God is reluctant to judge, for he's slow to anger. And judgment is his strange work. Isaiah says in Isaiah 28, 21, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his strange act. What is that? What is strange about God? That he judges, friends. The God of love, judging his creatures. And he says that he hath no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. This silence marks the transition from grace to judgment. He's waiting, waiting. And by the way, he's waiting today, waiting for you. Now, what we have here is the opening of the seventh seal, the last seal, also opened up the next series of sevens. And each one will just slide into the next series the same way, which ties them all together. They are just bound up in one bundle. And we're covering the period that's known as the Great Tribulation Period. But when you come to the trumpets, you're coming to that intense part of the Great Tribulation, which we'll see a little later on, labeled the last three and a half years of it. And we saw last time that there was silence in heaven of about half an hour. And it's awesome. It is something that is very solemn and something in one sense to some would certainly be terrifying because judgment is getting ready to come upon the earth. This is right before the storm of the judgment that's coming on the earth during that particular period. And this is the lull before the storm. Now, if you are from the Midwest, and those of you that are listening in the Midwest will understand the illustration I'm going to use now. When I was a boy, my dad, always everywhere we moved, he built a storm cellar. I spent half of my boyhood 
during the spring and early summer sleeping in a storm cellar because we think today that they have so many storms in that area. Well, it seemed to me like we had quite a few when I was a boy. Late one evening, my dad and I were standing in the storm cellar door, and he was watching this storm come up, and he saw that it was not going to hit our little town in southern Oklahoma. It hit one just about 10 miles away. But before that storm hit, we could see the funnel as it let down near that little town. There was a certain stillness that the wind had been blowing, the rain had been coming down, and there was a great deal of thunder and lightning. But all of a sudden, all of that stopped. And for a few moments, there was a death-like silence. And then where we were living, though 10 miles away, the wind, not a funnel-shaped hurricane or a tornado, but just a straight wind. I've never seen it blow like it did. It's all my dad could do to get that storm cellar door down, and I helped hold on to the chain with him. May I say it broke with all of its fury. Now, that's the way that the great tribulation will break upon this earth, and it's presented to us in this way with the trumpets, beginning with verse 2 and going through the 11th chapter, we have the blowing of the seven trumpets. Now we have, first of all here, from verse 2 through 6, the angel at the altar with a censer of incense. Now let me read verse 2 of the 8th chapter of Revelation. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and there was given to them seven war trumpets, or just seven trumpets. These seven angels are introduced as a special group. I believe Gabriel is in that group because we're told that he stood before God. That's what he told Zacharias when he announced the birth of John the Baptist. He says, I'm Gabriel that stands before God. So he apparently is one of them here. And the seraphim back in Isaiah, they're before the throne of God also. But these seven angels are seemingly a different order than the seraphim. And the reason is their mission and service is altogether different. Now, seven trumpets have a special meaning for Israel. And I don't want you to miss this. I consider this all important. And here is where it's essential to have a knowledge of the Old Testament. And here it is in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, you will find that Moses was given by God instructions for the making of two silver trumpets. And two was the number of witness. The Lord said on several occasions that in the mouth of two witnesses. Now, these two trumpets were used on the wilderness march in a twofold manner. They were used first for the calling of the assembly. And then when the children of Israel started out on the wilderness march, why, they were used to get them moving. And we'll see that in just a moment. Let me read to you Numbers 10, verse 2. "...make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps." And when Israel entered the land, the trumpets were used in a twofold purpose again, but not the same purposes. And let me read this. And I'm reading now Numbers 10, verse 9, and then verse 10. I'm reading. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets 
over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, they were used in another way. In the fourth verse of the 10th chapter of Numbers, we are told that when a single trumpet was blown on the wilderness march, it meant that the princes were to assemble themselves together. Now, verse 4, And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. Well, you notice that this trumpet here is, to my judgment, that which corresponds to the last trump that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But this was the bringing together of a certain group out of Israel that were to come together. And this is the trump that is mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52, when he says, "...behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed." Now, unfortunately, there are some that assume today that the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15 is the seventh trumpet of Revelation. Well, it's no relation at all. When Paul mentions him in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now, actually, you have here the voice of the Lord Jesus, his shout, and the voice of the archangel means his voice is like that of an archangel. We have that in our little book on the next happening in the program of God. And the trump of God is still his voice. His voice will sound like a trumpet. And that's scriptural fact. That's in Revelation 1.10. We saw that. John says that he heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet, and he turned to see. who did he see? The glorified Christ. Well, the glorified Christ is going to call his own out. And I think that when Paul speaks of the last trump here, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, that's the call of the Lord Jesus. It's the last call that he makes to the church, and it's called, therefore, the last trump. But the type of it is this calling out of the children of Israel, the princes. One trump is blown, and it has no relation to the movement of the children of Israel on the wilderness march. Now, here is something that is especially significant, and will you note it? The trumpet sounded an alarm which moved Israel on the wilderness march, and an alarm was sounded to move each division. In other words, the tribes were divided into four groups of three tribes each on the four sides of the tabernacle. And there were three separate families of Levi that carried the different articles of furniture of the tabernacle, Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. Now, four and three make seven. And there was a blowing of the trumpet to move Israel out. When the first trumpet was blown, why, the ark moved out, and the Kohathites were carrying it. And then the tribe of Judah moves out, and the two tribes under the banner of Judah, and then so on until they get them all on the march. You see, everything was done orderly in that camp. Every man knew his place, Every man stayed in his station, and there was no disorder in the camp of Israel whatsoever. And that's the reason Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order in the church. I wish the church was as orderly as Israel was on the wilderness march. Now, it took seven trumpets to move them out. There is a positive benefit of these trumpets. The seven trumpets of Revelation will have the positive effect of moving Israel into the land. 
And I believe that it will take these seven trumpets here to get all of Israel back into that land. That's another reason I don't believe the present return is a fulfillment of prophecy at all. This will be fulfilled in the great tribulation period, blowing of the seven trumpets as they were on the wilderness march. Now, after the seventh trumpet, Israel is identified for us in chapter 12 as the special object of God's protection, you see. So that what we have here that's essential is an understanding of the trumpets, and it'll prevent us from identifying the last trump of the church with the seventh trumpet of Revelation. And the trumpets of Israel were used at the battle of Jericho. So the walls of this world's opposition to God will crumble and fall during the great tribulation. And when the Lord Jesus comes, he'll put down the last vestige of rebellion against him and against God and establish his kingdom here upon this earth. This is a book, friends, of triumph and of victory for our God. And at the end, it has the hallelujah chorus, and maybe you and I can sing it when we get there. Now, I come to verse 3, and let me read. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should add it unto the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now, this other angel, I believe I can say positively that it's not Christ. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer in the position of his intercessor for the church. We saw that in the fourth and fifth chapters, that he moved out from that and has given to him the seven-sealed book. And everything that happens from there on in Revelation, he's in charge of it. And he's not moving as one of the actors down on earth's stage. He's in heaven with the church, you see, at this particular time. And he is not the intercessor. He is now in the place of judgment, and he holds the book of the seven seals. He's just opened the seventh seal, and he directs all the activities from the throne. This angel is, as is stated here, just another angel. It says, and another angel. And I don't think the Lord Jesus would be identified as that. Now, it is true back in the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate Christ appeared as an angel. I don't think he'll ever appear again as an angel. He will be as he is in the glorified body, and we're going to see him as he is someday. Now, the golden altar is the place where prayer is offered. So he's not in the place of intercession before the golden altar. He's now upon the throne. Incense is likened unto prayer. And there's a type of prayer. And we don't guess at that. Because back in Psalm 141, 2, David said, Let my prayer be set before thee as incense. Now, incense speaks of the value of Christ's name and work in prayer. He says, If you ask in my name, and that's his injunction, there is today a habit that many are falling into, many of those who really believe the Word of God. They end their prayer by just saying, Amen. And someone said it's redundant to say that because in your heart you are praying in Jesus' name. Fine. And I think it means more than just putting on the tag in, in Jesus' name. But I want to say this, if you're making a prayer in Jesus' name, and especially a public prayer, be sure and say it. it's in Jesus' name. That's very important, I believe. And here they are offering incense, and they sweet-smelling incense. You and I are not heard for our much speaking or our flowery prayer. We are heard when it's made in Jesus' name. The incense was given to this angel. That's interesting. Christ didn't need anything given to him 
when he prayed. The prayers of saints which were offered under the fifth seal are now being answered because of the person and the sacrifice of Christ down here. Now will you note verse 4, "...and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand." Now prayer is going to be answered because of Christ. Now will you note this? "...and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth." He throws it upon the earth. "...and there were thunders and voices and lightnings and an earthquake." Now the high priest, he took a censer with him as he carried the blood into the Holy of Holies. Now here the ritual is reversed. Because out of heaven, the censer is hurled upon the earth. In other words, the prayers ascended as incense. And now we have the answer coming down. They have prayed, O God, avenge us. They're tribulation saints. And the earth, having rejected the death of Christ for the judgment of their sins, must now bear the judgment upon their own sins. And the great tribulation is going to get underway. There are thunders. That denotes the approach of a coming storm of God's judgment. And voices reveal that this is the intelligent direction of God and not the purposeless working of natural forces, that God is in charge. And the lightnings follow the thunder. This is the reversal of the natural order. We see the lightning before we hear the thunder due to the fact that light waves move faster than sound waves. And the earthquake here is the earth's response to the severe pressure which is going to be placed upon it during the judgment of the great tribulation period. Now, friends, we have come here to the sixth verse of this eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to be blowing some trumpets or listening to the angels blow them. And it's frightful indeed, because this is the judgment of God now coming directly upon the earth. And we read now verse 6, "...and the seven angels, having the seven trumpets, prepared themselves that they should blow the trumpets." Now, this is a solemn moment. The half hour of silence is over. The prayers of the saints have been heard. The order is issued to prepare to blow. The angels come to attention, and at the blowing of the trumpets, divine wrath is visited upon rebellious man. The blowing of the trumpets does not introduce symbols or secrets. The plagues here are literal plagues, and this method today of evaporating the meaning of Scripture is just as bad as to deny the inspiration of the Word of God. In other words, it's saying that God doesn't mean what He says, but He means something else altogether. Now I'm reading verse 7. And the first blew the trumpet, that is, are the first sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled in blood, and they were cast into the earth. And the third part of the earth was burnt up, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Now, this is a direct judgment, of course, from God. Judgment falls upon all plant life, from the grass to the great trees. Every form of botanical life is affected first. Now, notice it's only one-third, however, but that makes a tremendous impact upon the earth. And fire is the great enemy, is the instrument that God uses. You remember it was the flood in the first global judgment. Now it is going to be fire. And the fact of the matter, this earth is to be transformed by fire, purified by fire. Now, the forests and the prairies covered with grass are partially destroyed by fire. One-third of the earth denotes the wide extent of the damage, and it means one-third, not one-fourth. 
And it doesn't mean one half. It means one third. And plant life is what he's talking about here. You remember plant life was the first to be created, and it's the first to be destroyed. In the record in Genesis 1.11, he begins with the plant life after order had been brought into the physical globe. Now, this is a literal judgment upon plant life in the same way that the seventh plague on Egypt was literal. Now, I've called attention before that there is a striking similarity between the plagues in Egypt and the trumpet judgments. And again, that's no accident, because if you're going back to the book of Exodus and say the plagues are literal, and every believer in the Bible has to grant that, of course, then you must grant that these plagues in Revelation should be taken in the same fashion. I do not know by what type of flip-flop method of interpretation or of hermeneutics that you can interpret one way in one place and another in another place unless the Scripture makes it clear that you can do such a thing as that. Now, probably I ought to turn over to Exodus, the ninth chapter, verse 18. And let me just pick up a few verses there. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. And then when the hail came down upon Egypt, why, we're told that it destroyed every herb of the field. Now, this is verse 25, and it break every tree of the field. Now, that was a hundred percent destruction here, one-third of the earth. Now, well, let's come to the second trumpet in verses 8 and 9. And again, I'm reading my translation. And the second angel sounded, or blew the trumpet. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown or cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And there died the third of the creatures which were in the sea, even they that have life. And the third of the ships was destroyed. Now, the sea which occupies most of the earth's surface is next affected by this direct judgment of God. And you remember again, back in Genesis, there was the separation of the land and the sea. And it occurred on the same day in which plant life appeared. And that's Genesis 1, 9, and 10. And I'll not turn back to that, by the way. Now, I want you to notice the exact language here. And that's the reason that I have given my translation and I've attempted to lift out the literal. And I think we need to pay very careful attention to the literal language here. John does not say that a burning mountain was cast into the sea, but rather a great mass or force as it were a great mountain, you see. As it were, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. As it were, a great mountain. Now, this careful distinction in the use of language should be noted, especially since it's the common practice to lump together everything in this book and call it symbolic. And that, of course, gets you out of a lot of trouble, but get you out of the frying pan into the fire, by the way. The mountain represents something as literal and tangible as that that we have in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, verse 25. Now, let me go back again to the Old Testament and listen to this language. Now, he's talking here about Babylon. And notice what he says. Behold, I'm against the O destroying mountain, saith the Lord which destroyest all the earth. And I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and make thee a burnt mountain. Now, this literal mass here 
falls into the literal sea, and one-third becomes literal blood, and one-third of all the literal living creatures in the literal sea die a literal death. Nothing could be plainer than this. And also one-third of the literal ships of all literal nations are literally destroyed. Now, if you we just let John say what he wants to, it makes it very clear. Now, there's no use to run and try to find some symbol that this is symbolic. Symbolic of what? That doesn't say this is symbolic. He makes it very clear that a great mass of force is put into the ocean. Now, I do not know what that could possibly be. And you say, well, why don't you know? Two reasons. First of all, John didn't tell me, and he didn't tell anybody. And that's the reason that I don't think anyone has the answer for it. And then the second thing is, I don't expect to be here at that time, so I won't be reading the evening papers. The bad news that we get in the papers and on TV today will continue, only more so in the Great Tribulation. I won't be here to look at it. And so this, as it were, does not concern me too much other than, what an awful tragedy, because coming on a Christ-rejecting world that actually ridicules the Word of God today. And this is something that certainly makes the believer sorrowful. But it ought to do more than that. It not only ought to affect our heart, it ought to affect our wills and our feet and start us moving today to get the Word of God out. That's our responsibility And I believe it's a very solemn responsibility that we have today. You can't keep this judgment from coming on the earth, but you can get the Word of God out and reduce the population that will be left on the earth at that particular time. Now, we come to the third trumpet, verses 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, I've read that in the authorized version. I'm going to read it now in my text. And the third angel blew the trumpet, and a great star burning as a torch fell out of heaven, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, or Absinthus. And the third part of the waters become Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, we're living in a world today where a great deal is being said about pollution, and it's a real problem today. Man seems to have beaten a star to polluting all the waters. Personally, I think that man is going to be forced today to clean up the water of the world if he's going to be able to exist at all. And, you know, self-preservation is considered the first law of nature, and man wants to hang on to this little earth, so he's going to do something about that. But here in the Great Tribulation, the fresh water's polluted, and the drinking water for mankind is contaminated. That is, a third of it is. And those of us that live here in Southern California, we know something of the scarcity of fresh water for drinking and domestic use. It costs in Los Angeles, I am told, somewhere around a hundred million dollars just to turn on the spigot to get water. That's what it takes to get the water here to us. And we've had several instances in this country of drought and the difficulty of getting fresh water. That's something that is essential for man and beast. I remember in Dallas, Texas, during the drought of the 50s, the water supply of the city came from man-made lakes, and the lakes dried up. Water supply was exhausted, and it was necessary to get the water from Red River. Now, the oil companies had let drain salt water that had come from their deep wells 
into the Red River. Well, nobody worried about it until they needed the drinking water. And the drinking water was so salty that it was barely possible to drink it. And I know because I was there during that period. And many people traveled to surrounding little towns to get a bottle of water to bring home. Now, these experiences ought to teach man how dependent that he is upon fresh water. And this is a judgment here upon this. And you remember, Israel had the experience when they crossed over the Red Sea. They came to Marah, and the waters were bitter there. And Moses was directed to take a tree when cast into the waters, made them sweet. Now, here in Revelation, the sweet waters are made bitter by a meteor, a star out of heaven. And somebody says, well, is this a literal star? I see no reason to think otherwise. And the tree that Moses put in, it speaks of the cross of Christ. Now, wormwood is a name here used metaphorically in the Old Testament according to Vincent in the following ways. It speaks of the idolatry of Israel. That's found in Deuteronomy 29, 18. It speaks of calamity and sorrow. And that is in Jeremiah 9, 15 and Lamentations 3, 15. And it speaks of false judgment. Amos the prophet in 5, 7 did that. He made that clear. Now, this star is literal and is a meteor containing poison which contaminates one-third of the earth's fresh water supply. Now, the name suggests that this is a judgment upon man for idolatry and injustice. Calamity and sorrow are the natural compensation that's coming upon man because of this judgment. Now, we come to the blowing of the fourth trumpet, and I'm reading verse 12, and in my translation... And the fourth angel blew the trumpet, and the third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon, and the third of the stars, in order that a third part of them might be darkened, and the day did not shine for the third part of it, and the night in like manner. Now, another phase of creation on which mankind on this earth is solely dependent for light and life is the sun. And to a lesser degree, of course, man's dependent on the moon and the stars. Now, it was on the fourth day of recreation that these heavenly bodies appeared. They had been created before, but the light broke through. And now the light is put out, as it were, on a third part of the earth. Now, God let these lights break through. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser to rule the night. And they were to be for signs and seasons. The Lord indicated that in the great tribulation, there would be special signs in these heavenly bodies. The Lord Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, the laws of nature are radically altered by these disturbances. There's a definite limitation. Only a third part of the light and of the day is affected. But the intensity of the light has the wattage reduced by one-third. You talk about an energy shortage. Believe me, friends, one is coming to this earth someday. This reminds me of during the time up in the Northwest and Seattle in particular... When Boeing shut down so many plants up there and several thousand men were laid off and people began to leave town and some wag put on a billboard as you come down Highway 5, this sign, it says, the last one leaving town, please turn out the lights. Well, God is getting ready to turn out the lights here on this earth. And the Lord made it clear, though, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. May I say that I think that there's something quite interesting in this connection, and I want to quote from Gauvet. 
He says, "...hence day continues still, though its brightness is diminished." God shows his right to call in question man's right to the covenant. He has not kept the terms. Blood for blood is not shed by the nations. By this time, the command to put the murderer to death is through a false philanthropy refused to the world. This is another angle to capital punishment. These judges with soft heads as well as soft hearts, they get rid of capital punishment, and they turn the criminals loose on us in this world today. And that's what's happened. And a man continues to move in that direction. God says that I gave you a covenant that you were to protect human life. And you protect human life when you punish criminals and actually remove them from this life. Believe me, that's a deterrent to crime. And any person that would say it's not a deterrent to crime must be like an ostrich with his head in the sand because it's quite obvious it's a deterrent to crime. Now, may I say to you, this is remarkable. I think capital punishment will be done away with by Antichrist if it's not done away with before. Now, may I read verse 13? And I saw and heard one eagle flying in mid heaven, saying with a great voice, Woe, woe to them dwelling upon the earth by reason of the remaining voices of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to blow the trumpet. Now, when the fourth trumpet is blown, the announcement is made here of a peculiar intensity of woe and judgment that's coming on the earth, and the last three trumpets are separated from the other four, and they are woe trumpets. Now, we have here one eagle, and somebody says, well, is it a literal eagle? Because he's talking. Well, if God can make a parrot talk and a few other the birds today, I don't think he'll have any problem with an eagle at all. And it's quite interesting that he chose the eagle here, because actually we are told that the Lord Jesus said this, "...wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together." And that's after the great battle of Armageddon. 